Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. And this is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. Good morning. How good are morning. You? Good. Happy Monday. I am good. Yeah, me too. I'm like kind of upset that we're about to be go- getting into serial killer September. Yes. <laughs> we are actually in the process right now, guys, of recording our serial killer stories. So we are depressed and dark Mm -hmm. and lacking sleep and having nightmares and we're all back in the swing of everything yeah i know sports football sports yeah exactly emery actually yesterday said he texted me and was like gosh work is exhausting today like how is how are things over there at home and i'm like freaking serial killers exhaust me too yeah (laughs) Like, you know, like clearly this is work for us. Like, it's not like we, it takes us three seconds to like put something together. It's like hours worth of process. And yesterday I spent all day doing it because I just needed to get it done. And I was like, I'm exhausted too, mentally, physically, (laughs) emotionally. I'm just drained. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I feel it. Yeah. Yeah, I've been working on my serial killer, the first one for weeks. So it's in a very yeah. drawn out process. I've done the whole like leave, come back, which is worse. Don't do it that way. Yeah, I know. I feel like that would be worse. Pro tip. Yeah. <laughs> Get it all done. Get it's it going to be done fun. You-, <laughs> you guys are excited. We have people asking us who we're covering. We're not telling. Mm-hmm. We're nope. giving hints. So you'll just have to wait till September 5th yes. for the first ones to come out. We've got survivor stories happening in September over on the Patreon. So if you guys are interested in doing that, I think we said it before, September's the month. Come check us out. Yeah. There's a lot of two, two back- survivor stories. Yep. And there's a backlog of stuff on there too. And you, so you'll get access to all of that. We do fun things on first Fridays. We appreciate yeah. all of our Patreons out there. You guys are the bomb.com and all you yeah. other guys listening to us are also the bomb.com. With the suggestions for the serial killers, I know we have a serial killer list now. Ugh. Like we used to, ju- we used to just have a list of like suggested cases, and now we have suggested serial killers, which I believe I might be doing one. Nice, nice. Mine is yeah. too. Um, I was sitting at lunch yesterday with my husband and my children, and we were talking about serial killers, and I was telling him about the one that I am doing, and he looked up the statistic that said something about the average person in the United States will meet something like five or come across, be in the presence of like five serial killers in their lifetime or something. I can't remember what it was, but anyway, it was like a shocking number. It's like a creepy Mm. number or whatever. It was like that whole, they walk among us type situation. And so we're sitting at lunch in this busy restaurant and he's like looking around, like could be that guy. Oh, it's definitely probably that guy. (laughs) (laughs) And then our kids are like, what are you talking about? (laughs) That guy's a serial killer. Yeah. Look at that guy's shoes. He is definitely off. (laughs) Or, you know, (laughs) anyway, it became a big joke. So, oh, that's fine. They get in your brain. They get in your brain. They do. And Mm -hmm. that is a scary statistic. Like, basically, it just is like you might like walk past or be like in a line next to him. Right. Or at a restaurant where one is eating or something. Not that you'll personally know them. You'll just be in the presence of one or five Mm -hmm. or or however many it was. Crazy. Anyway, it's not me. It's not me. You heard it here. It's (laughs) definitely not me either. So don't worry about that. (laughs) I wasn't worried. Okay, good. I I know we don't have the stomach for it. We don't, it's like barely have the stomach to read stuff. Well, exactly. Anyway, yeah. And I, and honestly, like I, I, in my head, I kept thinking like, wow, this first one that I'm researching really isn't that bad, but really he is. He's a terrible person. (laughs) Oh gosh. It's not like as bad as it could be. I feel like. (laughs) (laughs) That is messed up. (laughs) I know. I know. Like this is a 50 shades of jaded right there. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously. Anyways. Well, we do have a couple of weeks before we get to that. Um, so if we do you have anything else that you need to No. No. Okay. Well, then I do have a crime story for you. And it's well, they're all doozies, but if you remember, there's an interesting character in this one. Oh, I remember. <laughs> so you guys are going to like it. 
Yeah. So if you're ready for it, then I can give it to you. I'm ready, Freddie. So <clears throat> in order to dive into this one, I need to give you a little bit of background information. Okay. About, about a church. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah. This case intertwines with a much bigger and crazier situation um, that actually has an HBO Max docuseries about it. And I'd highly suggest you watch it. Um, oh, it was actually... You talked what? about it on our Patreon. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. A couple of months ago, right? I think it was in like June or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. So um, we got the suggestion... And I had like went to go look at this docu series, and it was already on my list. I just hadn't watched it yet, <laughs> and so I watched it real quick just to see what because uh, this case is mentioned in it very briefly, like for like a little over one episode. Um, anyways, it's it involves the Remnant Fellowship Church, and this church was started by Gwen Shamblin. And in in 1986, she had come up with a Christian weight loss program called the Way Down Workshop. Part of the teachings of this program basically said, don't eat until your stomach growls. And then when you eat, only eat enough until, to make it stop. Okay? Okay. Which, I mean, some people call this portion control. Just saying. But <laughs> it was um, somewhat to the extreme, I think, um, in some cases based on like, basically, basically you're starving yourself. You kind of look like, and are acting like you're anorexic in a way. Oh God, that's not okay. Like her daughter, I mean, not everyone looked like this, but like her daughter definitely looks like she's anorexic. Um, and like a few other people in the church, just like she does for sure. She, I mean, you looked at a picture of her a couple months ago and she's super skinny. There are so many things I could say about this woman. (laughs) Oh yeah. And the best, well, I was just going to say the best part of her is her hair. So, like, she's got this giant, like, beehive chrome over her hair thing. So, it's, it's unexplainable. You got to go look. Yeah, it is. You have to look it up if you haven't already. Um, so, anyway, so she started this workshop, this way down workshop. Um, and then, oh, in an interview, she also mentioned, which I saw, I think it was on the docuseries and just in general on, mo- on news um broadcast about this case. She said that people in the concentration camp started eating less and they lost weight. Honey, like really? They were starving to death and some of them did. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you. That you had the same reaction that basically the person interviewing her had. He was like, "Are you really making that connection right now and that's how you're promoting your <laughs> workshop? Like what is what's wrong with you?" Anyway, <clears throat> so After this, she decided to morph it into its own church called the Remnant Fellowship Church in 1999. Basically, like this workshop was being like taught in churches around the world and whatever, U.S. until, I mean, I think it still was being sold as like a program, you know, like they do programs, Bible studies and whatever. So this was just one of the programs that churches would buy. Um, but then she started her own church in 1999 and it was based in Brentwood, Tennessee, which is basically like Nashville. Nashville. Yeah. <clears throat> so they believe, um, they believe they are the remnants of the Christian church, like the only true Christian church out there. Essentially, they're the remnants of the Christian church. Yeah, Makes sense? Okay. <clears throat> so I haven't looked in depth into their religion. I clearly, I mean, I watched the docuseries, so I have a good understanding, but I'm not going to go into a whole lot about them. But they play a key role in this. So I had to give you, I have to give you a little bit. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> yeah. Is it a part of their teaching or belief that they all have to be thin? Well, yes, part okay. of it. I mean, because from what I was gathering, stuff I was reading and on the docuseries, that they, they definitely kicked people out. If they had lost weight and then they gained it back, they would kick them out or they would shun them or, you know, whatever. They'll deny that, you know, over and over again. But that's what these people are saying. Okay. So, anyway, Gwen Shamblin and her husband and several other members of the church were recently killed in a plane crash. So I just wanted to mention that in May of 2021. They were like heading to uh, 
West Palm Beach, I believe, for a uh, political rally. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, but they crashed in a lake, like right in Tennessee. So they didn't make it um, long or far. And apparently, I mean, there's definitely people that are saying that it was done on purpose, but there was a, more than just her and her husband. There was like two other couples and her son-in-law oh, no. on the plane as well. Nobody survived. Um, but anyway, she, they they said by the way the plane was going down, it was going down at a rate much faster than a plane like that is going down. You know, like usually it's like 500 feet per whatever. I, I don't remember the timing, but it, theirs was going down like five thousand or something i don't know it was like something some crazy that it was going down way too fast for it to just be like dropping hmm. like they were pushing it down but who knows anyways she was quite an interesting person again her hair was my favorite part but she legit had some um just other crazy things about her the things that she would say just watch just watch the document oh i'm gonna watch it <laughs> i mean and i don't mean to speak ill of the dead because clearly i mean that wouldn't be nice but she's crazy um <laughs> I don't her church to is speak definitely- over, but i'm speaking over real quick she's crazy <laughs> rest in peace though, uh, gwen rest in peace gwen uh and all the others her church has been the center of a lot of controversy over the years the docuseries is called the way down so her workshop was the way down w-e-i-g-h and this is called the way down w-a-y so hey, look little play on words there. Um, (laughs) They allegedly have some teachings that can be considered controversial. And I will say that authorities have not been able to link them to any specific law breaking yet, but that's because they're a church and it's hard to like infiltrate that kind of thing and whatever. So got it. They are said to include corporal punishment into their teachings as well. No. Yeah. Yeah. They say that spankings are used as a last resort and it's always done in love and that the Bible teaches do not spare the rod or spoil the child, which I have heard too. Sure. I don't take that to mean that I should beat my child, but, you know, that's my personal interpretation of it. I would agree. (laughs) Yeah. Some have said that they have used glue sticks to hit their children because they hurt a lot, but do not leave marks. Now, see... Long glue sticks. You know, if you're glue doing gun. something so that it doesn't leave a mark, it's a problem. Amen, sister. You want to start a church? <laughs> well, let me fix my hair. Hold on. <laughs> I, I don't quite have the hair to start a church. I'm not no, you ahead. don't. <laughs> you don't. Um, they also allegedly teach that when your child is disobe- disobedient, which in their world means not listening the first time. How many of your children listen the first time all the time? Zero. Well, apparently, if you go to this church, they will. They will, like, beg you to help you do things, which I'm sure because they are beat into submission. Like, you, I would be afraid, too. All you got to do is pull a little glue stick out your pocket and give them a side eye, and they're going to do whatever you want. That's not That's not parenting. I'm sorry. That's not. No. Mm -mm. No, it's not. And they even said, some of the people said that if you, if your child was disobeying, in the church, like you, op- they open their eyes during a prayer or something. That's like a staff member would come over and be like, "You need to discipline your child because uh. they didn't listen." And and according to these people, because clearly I don't know what is true and what is not, but they would basically expect you to take your child out and spank them until they cried in church. Anyway, uh, this I'm not. I'm disturbed already. Oh, you just wait. You should also. To discipline them, take everything out of their room and lock them in it for extended periods of time with just a Bible in it. Oh, my God. <clears throat> um, I also feel it's important to mention here that this church also condemns mental health or mental health issues. This church is a cult. This is not a church. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. They say depression is self-pity and selfishness. They once told a member to take antidepressants away from his wife and flush them down the toilet. Another co-leader had been heard saying on a webcast about people who are suffering from depression. This is quoting. This is what he's saying about them. There is nothing to be concerned about. What's the worst that happens? You die. So what? You'll go to heaven. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Girl, reading all of this stuff made me sick to my stomach. It was it was just awful. Because, I mean, there's so much stigma around mental health as it is. And this this church is basically like 
saying, yeah, that's right. You shouldn't be like, you should, you, there's no mental health. We, God can fix it all. You're being selfish. If you're depressed, like, come on, mm -hmm. like you want yeah. to be depressed. It's ridiculous. It doesn't even make sense. I know it's, yeah, it's, it's sad. It's a sad state of affairs over there in Nashville. <laughs> I love Nashville. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's why I guess I, I should say Brentwood so that we can like, yes, that is part of Nashville, but we'll just like say Brentwood. That's where the closet <laughs> killer was, by the way. Oh, right. They were in Brentwood. Right. And Brentwood's like an up, like high oh, yeah. end or high upper class. Dolly Parton, yeah. Taylor mm -hmm. Swift, they all live in Brentwood. All my girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's them. She has a church apparently that she donated um, like the property and the, the building itself. And then like a mile away or I don't know, somewhere close is called Ashlawn. And it was like her compound essentially where she had this beautiful, I don't know how many millions of dollars it was worth. Um, but house where she would like hold parties and like all the weddings that people got married within the church, they got married there and she like officiated and it was anyway, so it's a big, big compound. Hmm. Anyway, okay. Let's. I, I went further in than I thought I was going to, but that's because I watched that docu series yesterday, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Yeah. <laughs> so okay. I can't. So wait. let's start. Yeah, I'm going to start the story that I am intending to tell you. So, not a whole lot of background or information on the family that I'm about to discuss. So, I will just give you what I got. Wait, first, did someone suggest this case? Oh my gosh! Yes, I'm so sorry. Oh. I normally say that right from the beginning. I totally forgot. Morgan. Oh, our Morgan. friend Morgan. Okay. Hi, Morgan. Yes. Yes. Her and I had some discussions back and forth on, on Instagram yesterday about this. Well, but, but thank you. Thank you, Morgan, for suggesting it. Sorry, I forgot to mention it at the beginning. Um, okay. So Sonia and Joseph Smith have four children that I can ascertain. Michael. They're all that have very unique spellings of their names. I don't know why I feel the need to... to point this out, but Michael, which is M-I-K-E-L, was 16. They had eight-year-old Joseph, which was spelled J-O-S-E-F, two-year-old James, just normal James, and 17-month-old, I think, Malik, M-I-L-E-K. Okay. Anyway, Joseph also had at least one child from a previous marriage, a daughter, um, this family lives in Mableton, Georgia, which is northwest of Atlanta in Cobb County, back in Cobb. We've been in Cobb a couple times. I've been we? in the Cobb. Yeah. Yeah. So the Smiths were members of the Remnant Fellowship. Yes, the church is based in Tennessee. So they were essentially followers of their principles for the Way Down, like they had done the Way Down workshop program and then liked the principles of the church. And so then they decided to join, I guess, I don't know. I guess it was virtually back then too. It wasn't that long ago, but I had read somewhere that Sonia had lost about 150 pounds on this program and Joseph about 80. So much like most cults, I feel like these people that start them do have good intentions initially and probably have some good principles behind some of the things they do, but then something derails <laughs> this thing and it goes sideways. You know, I do. I don't know. That's kind of how I feel about most when I watch them. I'm like, well, this guy probably has some legitimate things that make sense, but you've taken it to an extreme that doesn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? I do. Okay. Okay. So they would listen to webcasts together in their kitchen, you know, for services and whatnot, or just, you know, probably go back and listen to old ones. Joseph, the son, was not a fan of these sessions. He would apparently cause the eight year old scenes and yell when they would do them and just be disruptive. Um, the Smiths were using remnants teachings to discipline their child. Uh -huh. The Smiths had said that Joseph had destroyed all of Sonia's things and tried to hurt James, the two-year-old, and also the baby, Malik. And he tried to set the house on fire. So from Friday to Monday, they emptied his room and locked him in there with just a Bible and a bucket for him to use the bathroom in. And they fed him very little food. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Four days. This child is just locked eight? in his room. And he's eight. <clears throat> and seems as though he's exhibiting some pretty extreme behaviors. So I get you need to discipline your child, but 
I'm not totally sure that this child needed this kind of discipline. I feel like he has, which you'll you'll hear later, he has some mental health issues that are not being addressed. Yeah, and solitary confinement is not going to help anybody. Oh, if anything, we could probably make it worse. It absolutely would make it worse. Yeah. So on October 8th, 2003, just days after this Friday to Monday punishment, I think it was like a Wednesday, the family gathered together to listen to a webcast. As they were praying, Joseph became belligerent and was screaming, cursing, carrying on. His brother Michael said that every time they prayed, Joseph would try to do things to his younger brother James, and he would try to hurt him. On this particular night, he, the, his parents asked him, Michael, to put James in this wooden chest or a wicker chest or something. I don't know. It's described as wooden wicker in different places. The chest was big enough for him to fit in like lying down. Michael said he had to tie the lid shut with an orange extension cord because Joseph kept popping his head up out of the box. So from what I understand, like the parents came over, like slammed the box down and then they tied it shut. While inside the box, what? No one was like, <laughs> this seems odd. Well, who else is there besides the family? Well, the son, I mean, well, okay. Well, yeah, but if this is the life, they're all homeschooled. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. They're all homeschooled. This is their life. Like, if this is how they're, you know, kids are kids. Yeah, you're right. We can't hold them responsible. This is I how understand. they're growing up. Right. You know, they don't know any different. So while inside the box, Joseph continued to yell and curse. He was making su statements such as, I'm going to kill all you mother mm, effers when I get out. James is first on my list. I'm going to slit his throat. Oh, goodness. So this is where I say I feel like this child has some mental illness, you know, because yeah, he needs some help. He's eight years old. He's, this isn't just, I'm pissed that you locked me in a chest. He needs help. It doesn't sound like typical ramblings of a kid that just doesn't want to pray. <laughs> so pretty disturbing. Michael does state that he believes his parents are afraid of Joseph and he is as well because he's, this isn't the first time he's made these statements. Apparently he's also written these things on the wall. Like I'm going to kill you, blah, blah, blah. After about 10 or 15 minutes, the yelling stops. Michael goes over to open the chest, and he said that Joseph is inside, not really responsive and making, like, really weird breathing noises. So his dad comes over and starts to do CPR, and then they call 911. When the paramedics arrive, Joseph is on the kitchen floor, still unresponsive. They take him to Wellstar Cobb Hospital and stabilize him and then transfer him to a children's health care hospital in Atlanta. Joseph never regains consciousness and dies the following day at the hospital on October 9th, 2003. Whoa, from being in a wicker box? Well, no. The parents report he passed out during the family's gathering for prayer time. So that they did not say he was in this box. They said he passed oh. out. That's what they told. But anyway, when the autopsy is done, here's where you guys should probably fast forward if you don't want to hear it. Because I've read this thing in its entirety, and it is awful. It is stated that the manner of death is homicide. The cause of death is blunt force head trauma associated with acute and chronic abuse. Oh, no. And also, they're cut, also I mentioned that specifically the parents slammed the door or the lid of the chest down, which probably caused it to hit his head if he was constantly trying to pop his head out right. trying to keep it. I'm sure that slammed hit him pretty hard. So there was a large area of recent bruising to the right side of his face with additional bruising to the right side of his head. His brain showed swelling. The report also noted that he had extensive nondescript bruising and contusions to his entire body. There were very, they were of various ages and he had extensive scarring. So it was like from constant abuse. Yes. Chronic abuse. They had a diagram of his body in this autopsy report and the number, which is also on that documentary that I should told you about. Um, there are a number of bruises and scars that are just drawn on the diagram. It was sickening, like, you know, because they have like the picture of the body and they mm -hmm. just put where all it was. Just, it was disturbing all the amount that he had. Some of the scars were in the shape of a hook of a coat hanger mm. and many of the marks were consistent with glue sticks. Oh, I like, thought they didn't one, leave marks. I know. That's what I thought they said, too. But anyway. Well, thank God they did. Um, yeah. I don't know if I had mentioned this earlier, but it was 
said, I, maybe I was going to mention it later, that they used glue sticks, belts, or coat hangers, warmed coat hangers. Oh, so that my. Was- that is sick. Yeah. So that's why they were like, some of those they realized were that like hook, that shape of the hook of a coat hanger. That's like st- sadistic to warm up a mm-hmm. coat hanger and like prepare yeah. it in order for your child's beating. Right. No. Yeah. That's, that's monstrous. Ridiculous. That's absolutely gross. Some people in that documentary, like who also knew this couple or had met them at somewhere along the line, um, had said that they like seemed like a really, you know, nice people and that they 100% believed that they were only doing as instructed by Gwen and like the leaders of the church. But those people will never admit to that. Well, some of them can't, but um, they'll deny this till the death. Sonia does say she would discipline him by whipping him in increments of 10 and that he had had that done several times that day. His father also had admitted to hitting him four or five times. When police had come to the scene, his father said, I'm not going to lie. He will have bruises. Like, okay, great. Thanks for being They honest. don't feel bad for doing it. They're like, no, we're, we're spanking our kid. Like, we're doing God's will. It's parenting. This is how I'm supposed to parent. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. They didn't really show remorse because they felt like they were doing what they were supposed to be doing because they were doing as instructed. Huh. According. Apparently. Allegedly. During the next weeks to months, things started to unravel. Six months prior to this, in April of 2003, the Smiths had visited a church, the church in Tennessee for like Easter weekend or something. While there, the kids were in the child care area, and one of the babysitters there noticed that Joseph was sitting in the corner crying. So she stopped his dad and said, hey, is there you know, a game or a toy or whatever that I can use to help calm him down? And his response was, just hit him hard. And she was like, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. And he was like, no, really, just hit him hard. And she's like, nope not going to do it. So he took Joseph into another room in the church and you could, she, according to her, could hear, she didn't witness it, but she could hear him hitting him because then Joseph was also getting even more upset, clearly. And then he brought him back and then they, everyone, including everybody else that could hear this happen, all walked into the church and says nothing happened. She has said, I never went back to that church again after this, like to babysit. She was like, I was done. So I read that her and her mom filed a report with DFCS um, about this, but it wasn't linked to this family because she didn't know their names. They were visiting. Mm-hmm. They weren't regular tenders. So there wasn't a whole lot of information out there to like be able to like look into this. Mm-hmm. But then the Georgia police found the link when, the, when, his, when he died. They realized, okay, once they started digging into things, okay – this is where it came from. But I will say that's not mentioned by her in the documentary. What she says is that she saw that he died on TV and then called. But I don't know why anybody would like they would say that there was found a link. So I don't I don't know. Maybe it just wasn't mentioned. But anyway, in May of 2003, just five months prior to this, Joseph Smith's daughter from his previous marriage called to file a report of suspected abuse. She said Joseph, the eight-year-old, was demon-possessed and claimed to be demon-possessed and that his eyes would roll into the back of his head as if he was going through a transformation. He would write on the walls that he was going to kill everyone and one time heated up a fork and put it down the pants of a sibling and left a scar. Well, where'd he learn that? Yeah, exactly, right? Hmm, I wonder. She also states that the parents had said he was demon-possessed and had video cameras all around the house to observe him, but would not get him mental help. This report was made in another county in Georgia, but was relayed to the Cobb County DFCS, and they requested that they go and visit the home. And weeks later made another request for Cobb County to go out, and they never did. After Joseph died, they said that that the request had been misplaced. So that was their excuse afterwards. This family based... based on church teachings, has had chosen to beat their child to death instead of getting him the mental help he so obviously needed, in my opinion. I believe he was truly mentally disturbed. There had also been stories heard that he would hide knives under his bed and threaten to kill the youngest siblings. As I mentioned earlier, like writing on the wall, carving on the wall that he was going to kill his family. He would say he was possessed by demons. He needed help. But Remnant chastised any mental help health help. Can I also just 
ask, and this is the family saying that he behaved this way. Did anyone yeah. else outside the family? Well, the the daughter, his daughter from the other marriage, who made the report. Okay. I think she was making the report like he needs help, okay. and they're not helping him. I understand. So in her head, that was abuse. Like they're not helping him. That is abuse. Um. Yeah. They're and they're then, causing him to have more mental health issues by abusing him, continuing to abuse right. him. Like, yeah, that's a real exactly. cycle. He's not gonna. Exactly. Oh. It's just a sad situation. It is. Also, another interesting thing that, interestingly enough, is not mentioned. It's barely mentioned in other sources. The Smith's youngest child, seventeen-year-old Malik, eleven weeks prior to Joseph's death, Malik died. Wait, it's like how, hardly mentioned. Start over, start over. 11 weeks prior? 11 weeks before Joseph was killed in the wooden box, Malik, the 17-month-old, had died. It's like barely talked about. It's like brushed over for some reason. His cause of death was cardiac dysrhythmia or an irregular heartbeat, like basically SIDS, they they were saying, I think. Um, because, and I guess what the what somebody was saying was that's like basically what, when there's no other reason for the death, they can't come up with a reason. That's just what they write, that it was SIDS when they're that young. But isn't SIDS, doesn't it stop at a certain, did you look it up? Okay. Yeah, we, we talked about this with another case. Okay. Um, what, uh, wasn't it Ellen Bowen? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that it does. Like after a certain age, it's much less prevalent and really doesn't happen. And I want to say it was 18 months. So he was like right on that cusp, but I don't remember the exact age. So this says most SIDS deaths happen in babies between one and four months of age. The majority, 90% of SIDS death happen before a baby reaches six months of age. However, it can happen anytime during a baby's first year. Yeah. So he's so still he's, well above that well, at 17 yeah. months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they couldn't find any other reason. So they that's what they labeled it. DFCS did make a visit out to the family home after his death. Sonia did not allow them to speak to the children, but they said that all the children appeared, the rest of the surviving children appeared to be clean and orderly and they were being homeschooled and everything seemed fine. So they didn't have a reason to suspect that anything other than SIDS is what happened to Malik. And I'm assuming that Malik did not have bruising or broken no, bones. Okay. No, but if all the other children are behaving and it's only Joseph that's not and is acting this way. And he's the only one getting punished. I see. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I see. So, but the question is, is why isn't it being talked about? Why aren't the people, like, why isn't this part of their story? Right. But it, it is out there, but it's not in all the sources. Like a lot of people don't even mention it. And you would think that whenever Joseph died, that they would go back and like open an investigation into the baby's death. Well, I think it was a medical examiner who said he wished he didn't, he had dug deeper. Hmm. Even at the time, but he didn't have a reason to think anything else had happened. So, oh gosh. Anyway, the Smiths were arrested for Joseph's death in December of 2003. They spent four months in jail until Remnant Church posted their bond and offered to pay all of their legal fees. Wow, that is really opening themselves up. Mm -hmm. They went to trial in February of 2007, where Michael testified all of what I had mentioned and what he had witnessed that day that I had said earlier. And he even had said that he at times had held Joseph down for his parents when they hit him. He also inadvertently said when they found Joseph, they were all praying not to lose another child. This caused issues in the trial because they had ruled before the trial started that the death of Malik would not be allowed to be mentioned. Don't know why. Maybe because they thought it would like taint the jury, like, oh, they had another kid that died. So they weren't allowed to mention it. But he just like inadvertently said, well, we began to pray because we didn't want to lose another child. And then then the judge said, disregard that statement, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it was a big to do. That's still weird to me. Huh. The couple's defense said that they hit that he had hit his head on a banister and then had a seizure. And then when that didn't work. They said that Joseph had died of complications due to his eczema. Oh, come on. Come Does it make on. sense to you? No. Okay. They stated that he had a high white cell count, which would point to an infection. Yeah, probably. But that's not the reason he died. 
This infection started because he had such bad eczema and he constantly was scratching it that he, until it bled. And so all of those were the scars on his body that they were finding because he scratched his eczema. I'm sorry. They were smaller, like little patches. Those would have to be small patches. I, my kid has eczema and he has a giant patch in like areas. It's not just like all these teeny, teeny, tiny spots. Right. Like from a glue stick or a coat hanger. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. No, people, no. So they're saying an infection started because of one of those like, you know, that he had scratched till it bled and then the infection moved to his bloodstream. That's what their defense is. What does the church the, say about them being liar, liar, pants on fire? That's done. That's not religious to that's lie. The church's, that's the church's defense. Oh, my God. That's their defense. It's their lawyer that is working for them. And that is what the church maintains to this day, that he died from his complications of eczema. The church will say that. Wow. This defense is rejected by the jury. Yeah. Because they convicted the couple of involuntary manslaughter, slaughter, <laughs> cruelty, aggravated assault, reckless conduct, and false imprisonment of poor eight-year-old Joseph Smith. Wow. They threw the they book were sentenced, at them. Uh-huh. They were sentenced to life plus 30 years. Not surprising because the assistant DA in this case said this was one of the worst like cases of child abuse that she had seen, like the injuries that she saw. Oh, ugh, awful. During the investigation, they did a raid of the Way Down workshop. And they did come across a taped phone conversation between Sonia and Gwen Shamblin. She is told to discipline Joseph by hitting him with glue sticks. Sonia says she did exactly with one of the what one of the church leaders had told her to do and spanked him on the back of his thighs and also locked him in his room when needed. Gwen responded by saying, this is not the entire conversation. I'm just giving you bits and pieces. But Gwen responded at the end by saying, You've got a child that's going from just bizarre to down to in control. So I praise God. Which she later in interview interview says those are just sign sound bites that are doctored together. But these are coming from tapes from her. Like, you know, when those those cults also like tape everything, they tape all their conversations. They have so many videos of what's going on and whatever. Like they literally document everything. Mm -hmm. Why do they do that? They like to see themselves. They're narcissistic. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Well, apparently this this tape is doctored. Whatever. They closed the case after a year, though, saying they couldn't find anything to specifically link them to the death. So they haven't been able to press any charges against the church. The church continues to stand behind the Smiths, pleading their innocence. They maintain a website called thesmithsareinnocent.com. Apparently, they also owned at one point the Smiths are guilty.com, which just redirected people to the Smiths are innocent.com page. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. They maintain the story of an infection. Like, I had to stop reading what they were writing about it because honestly, they make some great arguments that, albeit are far fetched, but like could make sense. And I, so I can totally understand why people would get sucked in and be like, yeah, they're innocent. Clearly, like he had this, this infection and went in his bloodstream and they didn't test for that. But, you know, whatever. They've had many appeal, made many appeals to trial courts locally, the Georgia Supreme Court, a federal court in Atlanta, and a federal appellate court judge. And every time the conviction has been upheld, upheld and the last one was in 2020. So they are still in prison. And then, of course, the death of Gwen started spiraling their, this whole case again recently in 2021. And that's when the docuseries essentially came out was in 2021 and blah, blah, blah. Like, so go watch that show because it has a little bit to do with this. Well, a lot to do with this, but like, it's just so much bigger of a conspiracy and like cults thing that, but it's, it's awful. It's awful. Go watch it. It is awful. And, but just to dare I say, Let's just say, let's just say that he had eczema mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that he scratched it so badly that he got infections all over his body so severely that it got into his bloodstream. His parents are still liable because he should probably have eczema medicine before it gets to the point of killing him. So even uh, that's a bad yeah. defense. Agreed. Agreed. Like, I either way, it's their fault. Even their own defense makes them look like bad parents. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. It's the whole thing. The whole thing is ter- the entire case is ter- awful. And it's sad. awful. And it's awful, too, to think about this is just one family. Oh, uh, yes. One family from this church specifically. But I read an article where they're there um, that mentioned a lot about this case, but then also a whole other slew of cases similar to this because of teachings from other churches, including one where there was like an exorcism of an autistic child. He's autistic. He doesn't, he's not possessed by demons or um, I can't even think of what the, what some of the other examples was. That's the one that stuck out of my head, but it's like, they are teaching that God can like cure whatever doctors can too, but no, no. God made doctors too <laughs> like, uh, for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they skipped over that part of the Bible where it says that we're responsible for like our own health and stuff. And we ha- like God helps those who help themselves. He puts doctors in place and m- give, makes them super smart so that they can invent medicine to cure eczema <sighs> Freaking ridiculous. and, and psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, couple just a couple of small things before I don't know if you have any anything else to add on this, but DFCS has maintained that none of the reports they received on Joseph contained accusations of abuse or neglect. So that's kind of their excuse of why they didn't like it was he's a demon and he's not getting help. Um they weren't and then the other one wasn't like specifically naming him and they didn't connect it to him because the they did the family or the babysitter didn't know the name. So Anyway, there was also an op-ed column written by a Georgia judge where he says the local services system needs to be more aware of mental illness of children. And the Georgia welfare officials were questioned about how they are trained to deal with cases such as Joseph. Like, do you believe, like, since he believed that he was possessed by demons and so did everybody else, would they consider it a mental illness that he needed to get help for? Or do they consider it a religious belief and the state should not get involved? And they did not get any answers from them about this. Well, a kid who has mental health issues and is not being helped is in danger. Well, agreed. And I don't even know that I believe that he did think he was possessed with demons. He was probably told that his whole life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's possible, too. I mean, there's a real possibility that he acted up two or three times and they were like, you're possessed by a demon. There's no other way to explain it. And so then he Mm -hmm. just thought that his whole life and he would do crazy things and be like, I can't help it. I'm possessed by a demon. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We'll never know. It's terrible. We'll never know. It's terrible to think of how many other kids were involved in that church and their parents were doing these same things things and like oh my all the glue sticks like there's uh, again i'm diving more into the the docuseries than i anticipated but um there's a couple people who um kids who left the church at like a little bit of an older age realizing probably what the hell and they committed suicide Mm. several other people attempted to and so come on there there's a reason these people are leaving the church and committing suicide because you are teaching awful things awful Awful things. Michael, the okay, so I could not find for the longest time what happened to Michael or James. Like, where'd they go once the Smiths went to jail? Like, who were they with? Whatever. I, I couldn't find anything about James any, anywhere. The only thing I could find was that Michael would go on to be convicted of robbery and sentenced to a 10 year prison term in April of 2017 in South Dakota after he um, hold, held up a store in Sioux City. In two, well, 2017, yes, because in 2015, he held up to the convenience store. So that's the only thing that I've seen about uh, the children. Wow. So I have no idea what happened. I don't know where he is. Well, I guess he's still in jail because he had 10 years sentence. Um, I don't know where James is. No idea. And- oh, but the Smiths are in jail and continuing Remnant Fellowship's work, by the way, as inmates and teaching the Way Down workshop and – and doing and holding church and Bible studies and continuing to spread the good w- word of Remnant Fellowship Church. Who runs the church now? Well, the daughter, Elizabeth, um, son left. They, I don't think he really wanted to be a part of it to begin with. And now that his mom 
left. She, he was like, okay, I can finally get the hell out. Um, the daughter, supposedly, but she has yet to really be seen in public. She's kind of been in hiding because all of this is still like kind of a big thing. Right. HBO and whatever. And now apparently on their website, she's listed as one of like 30 leaders instead of like the leader. Hmm. So I don't know what's going to happen with them. Somebody mentioned on the docuseries that it has a better chance of falling apart now that her son Michael has left because like he was supposed to be one that was going to take over. And when she died, he was like, peace him out. Mm. Divorced his wife, like left. Which says a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, very, very interesting docuseries. I highly recommend it. This is a sad case. Yes, it is a very sad case. Sad, and which is why Morgan told told us that it would be one for me to do because you wouldn't be able to I appreciate that. I really do. <laughs> like we joke about it all the time, but I have a, such a hard time with children. Mm-hmm. Even I, young I mean, adults. I do too. I don't like it, but I can power through it. Probably I think you do a better job of giving the information because it, I would sh- I shy away from like, you know, like I don't want to talk about the autopsy. I mean, I do, but mm-hmm. I don't do as good a job on them, <laughs> I don't think, because I just think they're awful. I mean, they are awful. Anyway, well done. I can't wait to watch the documentary on HBO, The Way Down. I'm coming for you. Mm-hmm. Do it. Rest in peace, Joseph Malik. My gosh, we'll never know. Mm-mm. I think the Smiths need mental health up in the prison. Mm-hmm. Sad. Agreed. The whole family just ruined by a conspiracy or brainwashing or cult, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like we're hearing about this more and more, you know? Yeah, because people are getting out. And like, probably also because of the documentaries that are out there. Like, True. they see them, they're like, oh, oh gosh, maybe this is terrible. <laughs> this isn't right. <laughs> You know, if you're on that cusp of like, you're not sure. Yeah. I mean, if you're all in, you're all in. You're not even going to watch those documentaries. But if you like are on the cusp and you're not sure, this is definitely helping people get the heck out. That's good. Yeah. Exposure's good. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for doing the research on that. And thank you for giving me plans for my weekend to watch this documentary. Thank you, Morgan, for your support and your suggestion keep them coming Mm -hmm. and we've got a lot of fun things coming for you guys serial killer september is on its way oh my gosh so we're gearing up it's too soon (laughs) (laughs) we're gearing up for that and stay tuned if you want to come find us on all the things we love that if you like what you hear tell your friends Give us a review send us a message we will share and shout you out because we love that If you want to hear more, we are on patreon.com slash crimes and closets. And always remember, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet.